National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen. Tonight on primetime, a woman had to beg the suspect in her brother's death to let her bury him. But during the struggle, a deputy stepped in to help how they are both helping each other to heal. Parents say their special needs students suffered months of abuse at the hands of Coweta County teacher. Now they say they have been left hanging by the district attorney. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Parents of students with special needs in Coweta County say they are not getting justice months after their children were allegedly abused in school. Six families met with the Coweta County District Attorney today to hear about possible charges for the people they say are responsible. Our Caitlin Ross has been following the story for you since December. The allegations are disturbing. A parapro at Elm Street Elementary School accused the lead teacher in a special needs classroom of throwing a shoe at a child's head, placing her hands around one of their necks and being verbally abusive to them. Parents say they weren't told about the allegations until weeks after it happened and that the principal violated mandating reported laws by not contacting police sooner. Since then, there's been an open police investigation. The principal has been disciplined by the school and both the teacher and the parapro have been placed on paid administrative leave. The parents I talked to today said they were hoping to hear the district attorney would be filing child abuse charges, but instead left without a resolution. It's disappointing that Jillian Wooten's son Aiden was an alleged victim of the abuse and came with her to the meeting today. She says the district attorney talked to them about offering plea deals to the teacher, parapro, and principal involved that could be misdemeanor charges. She says she wanted a jury trial. And why not at least try? And if we lose, we lose. But I would feel so much better just knowing that, hey, you know what? We didn't just drop the ball. We went as far as we could with this, but hey, we didn't win. So rather than, hey, let's Let's offer this and let's offer this. Because where's the justice for the kids? Nothing is final yet. Wooten says she won't know the details of the agreement until at least next week. The principal is back on the job at Elm Street Elementary School, and both the parapro and the teacher have moved on to different jobs in education. We are tracking more rain tonight. This video coming from storm tracker Jennifer Rigby out of Smyrna. Chris, these showers. <laughs> <Who>? <laughs> Jennifer Rigby That's out of Smyrna. Boss. Yeah, she is. <laughs> Doing, doing work from, from home. Management never sleeps. Never forget that. No, <laughs> and, and neither does the work of a hardworking storm tracker, whether you're inside or outside the building. Chris, what are we looking at ahead? You know, Jennifer to told me that that rain was a lot heavier than it looked in that video, and it looked pretty heavy to me there. And we had uh, massive amounts of rain come through Atlanta a little bit earlier, where we've, we have seen some flash flooding uh, on some roads because of that rain coming down very heavy in just a short period of time. Now the heaviest activity has moved on over to the east of us. 
Express, and it's about to move into Athens right now. It's not as strong as it was earlier when it was over us here in North Atlanta, North Fulton. It started weakening a little bit in Gwinnett, but still it was heavy in Gwinnett, and now we have this band of heavy rain about to move into Clark County right there at Oconee County, and some lightning still with this. About five or six lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes is what we're seeing uh, with this right now. Winder, you got soaked. Uh, Hampton, uh, Monroe. Now this is about to move into Watkinsville and into Athens. We're showing 14 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes, but really just in the past few, it's only like four or five here as that is showing signs of weakening. Here's a look at the heavy rain that it left behind. We've got a couple of spots like right here on top of us in Midtown. We picked up in a short period of time two inches of rain over an inch over in a parts of East DeKalb County. North Fulton had an inch and a half, an inch and a half in parts of Cobb County too. Again, that was in a short period of time, so that's why we saw some of that flash flooding in some areas. But now that's moving on over to the east. We have some other showers developing in Northwest Georgia. Those are going to uh, continue to move on out tonight as well, so it will be quieter out there overnight. We will see additional showers redeveloping again tomorrow. We're going to talk more about that timing as well as show you how we could have double trouble in the Gulf of Mexico next week with some tropical systems. All right, Chris, we'll be keeping an eye out for all of that later. A Gwinnett County police officer has been fired tonight after an incident viewed widely across social media. According to the police report, the officer was investigating a report of property damage when an argument broke out between him and a woman outside of a home in Loganville. The social media video shows it escalated to the point where the officer used his taser on the woman. And today, Gwinnett County police released that officer's body camera video from the incident. Come on now. Get on the ground. Get on the Get on the Get ground right now. Taser, taser. The Gwinnett County Police Department says the arrest of Kendisha Smith was justified, as was the use of force. However, they say that Officer Michael Oxford did not live up to their policy of acting in a kind and considerate manner, so they fired him. We'll continue to follow the story for you and have much more on 11alive.com and later tonight on Up Late at 11 on 11 Alive. Atlanta was a big part of the Democratic National Convention's final night. Mayor Bottoms was one of Joe Biden's earliest supporters and was on the short list for the VP slot last night. She spoke about civil rights and paid tribute to the late Congressman John Lewis. The baton has now been passed to each of us. We've cried out for justice. We have gathered in our streets to demand change. And now we must pass on the gift John Lewis sacrificed to give us. We must register and we must vote. Joe Biden has officially accepted the party's nomination. Now the focus is on the Republicans with the RNC scheduled to start on Monday. Joe Hankey today looking into what the Republicans may have learned about hosting a virtual convention from the Democrats. Over the past four nights, Democrats showed their version of hosting a virtual convention. And a political analyst I talked with today said there were moments that worked, moments that didn't work, and Republicans can learn from all of it. You didn't um, have the opportunity for any gaffes or verbal flubs or errors or miscues. Republican consultant so and 11 Alive political analyst Mike Hassinger says the often pre-recorded DNC showed the blueprint for avoiding a tragic error. Downside to that is it is exactly that. It looks rehearsed. It looks sort of stale. Hassinger says alive moments such as former Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Kamala Harris waving to monitors of distant voters instead of an in-person audience felt unauthentic. The Republican National Convention is going to try to learn from those sort of moments and, and not duplicate it, but do something different. One place the RNC may attempt to do something different is the acceptance speech. Kamala Harris and Joe Biden delivered their speeches from virtually empty rooms. Hassinger says that is not the environment President Trump prefers. He needs to feel audience feedback, whether that's good or bad. He That's sort of where he gets his his charge. And while around 100 delegates from around the country arrived in Charlotte today and more expected over the weekend, no speeches are planned in Charlotte. Trump now set to give his acceptance speech from the White House South Lawn on Thursday. No word if there will be a crowd, but Hassinger expects Trump is still pushing for an energetic convention, albeit virtually. He wants a big show, uh, great speech, dramatic backdrops, big fireworks displays. He wants a, a visually appealing convention. And while the DNC featured several Georgia Democrats in key speaking roles, the full speaker list for the RNC has not been released, but so far, no word of any Georgia Republicans playing a role. 
All she wanted was to put her brother to rest, but she had to ask the suspect in his death to do it. Next, how a deputy helped her through this painful process. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe, join the conversation that's right there in the community section. There's more 11 Alive news in prime time coming up after this break. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. A grieving woman and a deputy bond over the pain of losing loved ones to violence. A heartbreaking story here. A woman who had to beg the suspect in her brother's death for the right to bury him. But as Latasha Gibbons reports, an unexpected encounter led to healing. I get emotional even thinking about the care that they took with me. Erin Zachary is talking about the deputies who helped her during a very difficult time. She lost her brother, Brett, after police say he was stabbed to death by his wife, Roxanne. But in order to bury Brett, Georgia law requires the body be released to next of kin. In this case, that meant his wife. Aaron went from the Gwinnett County Courthouse to the jail, trying to get the proper documents to get her brother's body. When I got to the jail, I didn't really have much hope that this would work. It was my last shot. I went in and they listened. They did not cut me off. They didn't dis dismiss me. And that's when she met Deputy John Franklin, who started giving her directions. And he said, better yet, I'm going with you. I said, hey, listen, you know, I know what you're going through personally because two months ago, I just lost my brother. Deputy Franklin's baby brother, Ryan, was also murdered. And in that moment when Erin shared with you what happened to her, what did that feel like sharing that space at that time? <sighs> it, it took me back. It took me, it took me there. So I knew exactly how she felt. It's, it's very painful. Um, I would have never imagined in a million years that I would have lost my younger brother. There's some times where I just think about, um, you know, my brother and just calling him. Erin needed her brother's wife to sign the paperwork, so Deputy Franklin stayed with her while another deputy went to get the signature. Aaron says Franklin stayed with her until the papers were signed. Once it was signed, they sent it back to me, gave me their condolences. He even, you know, gave me a little bit of counseling and said, you know, this will pass and you will get through this. They went above and beyond their job today because that's definitely not their job. Like many of our deputies, she's just a very caring, empathetic person who really genuinely wants to serve others. And that service comes in many different forms sometimes. Shannon Volkadoff says Deputy Franklin was also part of a team of deputies who saved a man who tried to jump off their second floor building after an unfavorable court hearing just a few weeks ago. I can't even explain to you what it meant, how much compassion they showed me. And 
how, you know, helpful they were. We've been tracking heavy rain that moved through the metro area. Now that is pushing off to the east and it's about to move into the Athens area, uh, but it's not as strong as it was a little bit earlier when it came to Atlanta. It dumped a lot of rain on the city with a, a lot of water on the roads that caused some flash flooding in some spots. Uh, the rain is over for us in Atlanta right now. We're watching some other showers over near uh, south of Birmingham. These are most likely going to fall apart as they get closer to West Georgia, but we'll keep an eye on that. This is the main area of rain that's moving off to the east right now you can see how it moved through the city there on the north side and then up 85 through parts of Gwinnett County. And now that heaviest part of this is uh, passing through parts of Jackson County, the northern parts of Oconee County there into Walton County. It's moving into Clark County, approaching Athens right now. There is a little bit of lightning with this again, not as much as what we had earlier, but right now we have about five lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. This stretches from Jefferson down toward the Bostwick area uh, as you move into the northern parts of Morgan. County. A couple of showers still left behind between Lawrenceville and also into Snellville, but that's the back edge that's moving out. We have a few other showers up in parts of northwest Georgia near Dalton, and again, we'll keep an eye on that in Birmingham. We expect that to weaken before it moves in. I just mentioned Athens. Take a look at this. Isn't this a beautiful shot? This is live right now from our tower cam there in Athens, looking over the government building there uh, to the north and west. You can see some of the light on the horizon as the sun is going down, but then also these rain shafts. This is what's coming in from the west right now, about to move into the Athens area. I'm going to keep an eye on this camera. We'll be showing it throughout prime time tonight, and you can see how things are going to be changing very quickly over in Athens. And then behind the rain, look what some of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers caught. This is Travis Acona from Tucker. Uh, got this beautiful rainbow picture, very vivid and even a double rainbow there. Here's another picture of that. This is from Lauren Williams. When she was in Lawrenceville, she captured this vivid rainbow. And again, uh, part of a double one there as well. And I've been getting a lot of pictures in from our storm trackers and you, our viewers of the beautiful rainbows that folks are seeing out there tonight. That's as those storms move out and the sun is setting there to the west and that shines through some of that uh, moisture and gives us those rainbows tonight. You can see how things are moving out and everything is diminishing in the morning. We're going to see some clouds mixing in with sunshine at times and at lunchtime, a mix of sun and clouds. But tomorrow we're back to that pattern where we'll have a dry morning and dry lunchtime, and then it's going to be in the afternoon when we see scattered showers. I, I have our rain chances at about 40%, and actually this model is bringing that down a little bit more. So I'm hoping we will see a lot more breaks in the rain here on Saturday, Sunday. Another dry start to the day and about a 40% chance for showers developing once again in the afternoon hours as well. Hey, we've got a lot to watch out on the Atlantic right now. Tropical Storm Laura is right there near the Leeward Islands, and it's going to be moving through Puerto Rico and also the potentially the British and, and um, U.S. Virgin Islands. That's where they have tropical storm warnings in effect. Watch this as it moves uh, really over these islands here, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Cuba, south of Florida once we get into Monday, and then into the uh, Gulf of Mexico becoming a hurricane. This track has shifted landfall a lot farther to the west here for Wednesday. So we'll keep an eye on that. A lot's going to change over the next few days. There's a second system that could become a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico next week as well. That one looks like it's going more toward Texas. So two potential hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico next week. In our next half hour, I'll explain uh, what could happen if those systems could get near each other. Um, 87 for a high Saturday with a 40% chance for showers. Pretty much the same thing Sunday. Lower rain chances Monday, back to 40% Tuesday and Wednesday. And then Thursday and Friday, those rain chances are all going to depend on what happens if those tropical systems move inland and where they go after that. Chris, thank you. In the midst of a pandemic, financial struggles are forcing two rural hospitals to close their, to close their doors. This in a part of our state with a number of ICU beds available to treat patients are already in the single digits and community leaders feel that this is just the beginning. 11 Lives Brittany Kleinpeter has a story. There are at least a dozen hospitals in rural Georgia that are going to close. This week, Northridge Medical Center announced it will be closing its doors. Three weeks ago, Southwest Georgia Regional Medical Center came to the same conclusion. Both hospitals will be closing in October, laying off over 100 employees, leaving the communities they serve in a difficult spot. Staff at Southwest Georgia Regional say that it has become increasingly difficult for small, critical access hospitals to survive in rural areas, and that, quote, COVID-19 pushed the Cuthbert Hospital past the point of no return. The new Georgia project is a statewide initiative to help increase access to services for communities of color. 
The president of the organization warns these closures will take a toll on Georgia's poorest families. One of us is unprotected or one of us doesn't have access to health care, then none of us are safe. And none of us actually have access to health care. Health care lobbyist Monty Vizi cautions that rural hospitals are major economic engines for the communities and have experienced devastating losses due to COVID-19. Regardless of the size, is the economic engine in the community. Then when you that hospital closes, we've seen other business that have closed. Earlier this week, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services announced that the agency would give more than $35 million to states to support rural hospitals. But the worry is it's merely a Band-Aid. In the state where over 100 people are dying every day, uh, highlights and puts a fine point on the need for universal access to quality health care. According to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, a large number of uninsured and poor Georgians live in Randolph County, which is where Southwest Georgia Regional is located. It's also the same county that had the highest rate of infection in April of this year. Sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. But while I'll be a Democratic candidate, I will be an American president. Joe Biden accepting the Democratic Party nomination for president, getting high marks for his virtual speech last night. Joining me now is Chuck Todd, the moderator of Meet the Press. Chuck, uh, good reviews for Joe Biden last night. I am reading Peggy Noonan in the Wall Street Journal today, where she says the Democrats missed the meaning that they clearly are offering much, but they're not offering any plans about how they're going to do their so-called much. Well, I think there's no doubt in my mind, Jeff, that was intentional. You know, I think that what Joe Biden is trying to be is all things to a coalition that includes AOC and John Kasich, right? And, and he's in some ways making the case that, hey, I'm me. I know how I will, I'm not gonna get pushed around but I, I'm also an open mind, and I listen, and I will, I will take, I will take it, I will take advice from everybody. And he's making a bet that that's what the country wants. 
Um, I do think this is a, this is a, it, I think they're right. My gut is they're right that this is not going to be a policy election, that this is a, this is a Trump character election. They can throw a wide tent if they're united on one issue, which is ousting Donald Trump. The minute you start talking about other stuff, that's when that tent starts to get holes in it. So the Republicans get their shot next week. What about lessons in this? What is their approach likely to be? Is it, is it a lot of patriotism? Is it a lot of, you know, somewhat what Nixon did in 68 when there was a lot going on in the streets where you're talking about law and order? Is that what we're going to see a lot of? You know, Jeff, it looks to me as if there's a bit of a, they're having a bit of a, a debate about that because I've noticed message whiplash out of the president you know, if you think about it, the, the Democrats painted a pretty dark picture of things uh, and an even darker one of what they think life would be like in a second term. Donald Trump likes to paint a very dark picture of what he thinks <laughs> a life would be like if Joe Biden uh, uh, wins. Um, but when you have a country where 70 percent of the country thinks we're headed in the wrong direction, 60 plus percent think we we don't have a good plan to deal with the virus, that's not a, a, co a country that's in a good mood. And so you have a president who wants on the virus to project optimism, to project that, hey, he's, we're turning the corner because he wants his response to be viewed as a good job. Um, but if, the, if, if their tone and tenor doesn't sort of meet the atmosphere of where these swing voters are, then they could look tone deaf here. And, and that's the question I have. Is it, is it a convention that's designed to please just the base? Or are they going to attempt to talk to this middle that is exhausted? Um, both with the polarization and the virus. Let me take you a little bit of a different direction here. We had some polling. We did some polling about, uh, I'm going to guess about 10 days ago, showing that Kelly Leffler uh, is faring well against Doug Collins in her attempt to, to try and keep the Republican mm -hmm. uh, nomination here for the U.S. Senate. And I, I have spoken with someone on the Democratic side. I ran into it at a Trader Joe's who told me that Reverend Warnock, who would be running against either Leffler or Collins, has not yet brought together this broad coalition of Democrats. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't, but it's interesting. Right. Those who are writing this sort of political obituary of Kelly Leffler were wrong. She seems to be buoyant. She seems to have found a, a second wind here. Well, she's also got the money to do it. I mean, I think it's one of those cases if it, it, you know, a lot of times when somebody has, has a takes a hit the way she took a hit, you don't have the resources to sort of mitigate the damage. And I think in, in that sense, she had the resources. You know, bigger picture, uh, I, you know, you're, I'm, I'm starting to notice here, I, you know, as, as, as Democrats want to talk about Georgia in the battleground, both for those Senate seats and, and the presidential election, I've been looking at a lot of polling too recently. And boy, Georgia still looks like a lean red state to me. You, 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 you look, it, it is, it does look like it's not there yet. We'll see. It's still a lot of action. We know there's a lot of, but it, I have noticed, I feel like Republicans are faring slightly better in Georgia, for instance, than I've noticed in neighboring Florida or um, even South Carolina, North Carolina. We've been hearing that a long time. I know when I was covering the 2010 gubernatorial race here between the former Governor Roy Barnes and Nathan Deal, there was so much talk nationally about Georgia mm -hmm. not only going purple but going blue. And I mean, that was a decade ago, and we still haven't seen it, though. Right. You know, as we've talked about, it's closer yeah. and closer and closer, but that day has not yet shown itself. That's right. And it, 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 to me, I look at it. And, I, you know, for instance, the, the, right now, technically, in the NBC battleground map, we have four states that are technically fit in the toss-up category. Georgia's one of them because on paper, the polls have shown it is a one- or two-point race in the presidential. There's no doubt about it. But you look, our four toss-up states right now are Iowa, Ohio, Texas, and Georgia. And I will just say this. Iowa and Ohio, I see a path to 50 for Joe Biden. I, I'm, what, I, what I struggle with in both Georgia and Texas is I see a path to 47 or 48. I don't quite yet see that path to 50. Chuck Todd, thank you. Meet the press air is Sunday at 10 a.m. on 11 Alive. We appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do.
let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1101 Live News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for nine. Check it out. This is what the first day of the fall semester looked like for students at the University of Georgia. Spaced out desks, masks on, and students ready to learn. UJ community members are encouraged to log any symptoms of COVID-19 each day before heading onto campus using an app. Students are also required to log any positive COVID-19 tests. Universities across the country are trying to figure out how to continue with classes safely and some have already seen pitfalls. At Oklahoma State University, a sorority house under quarantine already for exposure after one week. But the administration is stepping up its efforts to wipe out the virus, including advanced contact tracing. NBC's Morgan Chesky got an exclusive look at the technology in action. Colleges and universities changing course nationwide, halting in-person classes after COVID outbreaks and scenes of packed parties like this at Villanova, University of North Georgia, and this scene near Oklahoma State University just before school started. Over the weekend, an off-campus sorority house quarantined with 23 members testing positive. The school is hoping to keep more than 23,000 students safe with a high-tech solution to contact tracing, something that uses everything from course attendance to card swaps to campus purchases to, most importantly, Wi-Fi on the students' phones when they set foot on campus. To see how this technology works, we follow Jared Moore for a day in the life of a college freshman. Leaving his fraternity house, Jared heads towards campus. First stop, the student union to buy a snack. No better where to start the day. Thank you. Then it's off to class. We're just starting class. Yeah, we're all socially distancing. Um, okay. Afterwards, a quick stop at the library. A short break at a pet therapy event. Oh, just shake. Hey, boy. boy. Finally, lunchtime, where Jared goes off campus. Then an afternoon gym sesh before heading back to his fraternity house. Got some guys hanging out in here. Oh, what's up, Jerry? <laughs> the next day, a look behind a high-tech curtain. 
he had class in that building. You can see student union, there was a food purchase, so that's a card swipe. Dr. Christy Hawkins oversees the contact tracing technology. What we can see, of course, is the buildings that he was in. Those are the ones that are highlighted in orange. But you can also see the possible contact locations. With more than 5,000 Wi-Fi hotspots around campus, Hawkins says they can know exactly where a sick student may have been. What this basically tells us is the buildings he was in for at least 15 minutes throughout the day. And specifically where in those buildings and he was. where in those buildings so if I go into the library you're not only going to be able to say uh, I was on the first floor but I was on this side of the building in the first floor here's who I could have come into contact with yes but when it comes to off campus we would not be able to track that so this is limited to on-campus activity as for having their activity tracked students have mixed feelings it feels like you know we're kind of like being spied on, but not really. If it helps us with COVID and keeps everybody safe from the harmful effects of it, then I'm all for it. The university's president stressing the information gathered is private. We've got lots of information on everybody on our campus, but we don't distribute it. We don't share it with anybody. To already have more than 20 members of an OSU sorority testing positive, a house under quarantine, do you feel prepared? It worked the way it was supposed to work. Everybody that was involved in recruitment was tested and they were negative. But somebody came in that was positive. For students, educators, and university leaders, navigating this pandemic might just be the toughest class yet. Meanwhile, more than 300 UGA faculty and staff members signed on to a letter calling in-person learning unwise because of the state's high transmission rate. You can learn more about that letter on 11alive.com. Tonight, 11 Alive wants to shine the spotlight on race in America and the words that we use when protesters took to the streets demanding police reform. Some pivot uh, the conversation to black on black crime, but does that phrase unfairly perpetuate racism? Here is reveal investigator Andy Parati. When a black man dies at the hands of law enforcement, outrage on the street often follows, but so does another narrative. 93% of blacks in America are killed by other blacks. Why is there not the outrage when there's black on black violence? Black on black crime, a catchphrase some believe conservatives use to distract from police brutality. And it makes so bad that this black on black crime. A phrase also recently used by Doherty County Coroner Michael Fowler after a rise in homicides near Albany this past May. Nobody's saying anything. Like it's just something they're pushing up under the rug. Not so, says Clifton Crowley. He says black communities are talking about it. The media just isn't paying attention. Crowley is the community chair for the Atlanta NAACP. There's always been a deep level of concern for violence and, and poverty and crime within our community. The licensed social worker points to a long list of local and national organizations focused on reducing violence in black communities, including street groomers, 100 black men of Atlanta, and former President Barack Obama's My Brother's Keepers initiative. You have to look beyond the race. Rodney Bryant is Atlanta's interim police chief. He doesn't dispute violence in black communities is a problem. In Atlanta, 81% of victims to violent crimes were black in 2018. Nearly 90% of people arrested for those crimes were black too. But Bryant argues violence is often a side effect of generational racism, which has created a health, wealth, and education gap. I think it does do the black community a disservice when you say it's a black on black crime because now you're saying it's just a black problem. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the majority of violent crime happens within the same race. A 2018 national survey found offenders were within the same race as the victim 70% of the time for blacks, 62% for whites. Here again is the Doherty County Corner speaking with 11 Alive's Faith Abube. Have you ever used the term white on white crime or Hispanic on Hispanic crime? No, if I see it, I see it. I just call a spade a spade. If I call it for black people who use that term, I want you to think about the systematic racism that has occurred in this country and the effects of taking out three million black faces, incarcerating them, and releasing them back into the community. Professor Brown says black communities are typically over-policed, which increases the number of black arrests. 
even when departments have a high number of black officers. APD interim police chief Rodney Bryant says Atlanta changed its response strategy years ago to focus on directing responses based on call volume and population. You can tune into our sister station, 11 Alive, on Wednesday at 9 p.m. for an 11 Alive special, Equality Matters. We will examine social injustice and systemic racial inequalities in our community. Two nurses now on administrative leave following the death of a man while in custody of the Cobb County Jail. You have to go! You have to go! This all comes after the community rallied for justice outside the jail. They want the district attorney to launch a criminal investigation into Cabell Wingo's death. 11 Alive's exclusive reveal investigation uncovered a 2019 video of Wingo pleading for medical help inside the jail, but instead of bringing him to the hospital, jail staff put him alone in a padded room where he died. Wingo's family, the NAACP and the ACLU and state representative David Wilkerson are all calling for action. Everyone ignored his cries for pain. That has to stop. It is time for this Cobb County District Attorney to take our pleas seriously and to listen to Kevin Wingo and his family for the first time. We all saw the video. I don't think anybody thinks that video is acceptable. The Cobb County District Attorney's Office says it is reviewing records related to Wingo's death. More than 18,000 Georgia businesses were approved for PPP loans, but some of Metro Atlanta's wealthiest areas receive the most money. A look at the new report coming up next. Hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Some of Metro Atlanta's wealthiest zip codes receive the most money in PPP loans. That's according to a new report from our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle. 
PVP loans were created through the CARES Act to help small businesses that were suffering because of the pandemic. Data from the Small Business Administration shows that of the top 10 zip codes approved for the most loans, six of them are in some of the wealthiest areas of Metro Atlanta. Here's a snapshot of some of the zip codes that were approved for the most PPP loans. The zip code approved for the most loans was 30339 near Vinings and Cobb and Fulton counties. That lands at number 20 on the list of wealthiest zip codes. The top 25 wealthiest zip codes account for nearly one third of the loans paid out. The top 10 are all less than 12% black. Only two majority black zip codes were approved for more than 100 of these same loans. We spoke with Peter Roberts. He's a professor at Emory who has studied small businesses for years, including lending patterns. He says this is a deeply rooted structural problem that goes beyond PPP loans. The pattern that you see through the PPP period is exactly the same pattern as you see from 2010 to 2017. So the idea of sort of post previous meltdown, you had this fairly dramatic two ish to one disparity that's replicated with the PPP. Um, so the first thing you think is it, it probably is something that's longer and deeper than just what happened during this program. According to the Atlanta Business Chronicle, compared to the majority white zip codes, majority black areas in the U.S. miss out on about $1.1 million in SBA loans every year. Robert says fixing the problem is going to take policy changes and creativity. Uh, you know, you can't ask the SBA to do something now that it was unable to do, you know, for 2010 to 17, which is stimulate kind of businesses before they see them. Um, and so I think we need something else to go back and say, how do we create an on ramp where the entrepreneurial capacity in this neighborhood can grow from informal to formal? So you've got the two, three, four, five employees, right? Then you've got the relationships with the kind of SBA lenders. And next time this comes up, we kind of have, you know, a more balanced systems and structures so that next time something horrible happens, we can deal with it better. Previous reporting from the Atlanta Business Chronicle shows many minority business owners did not tap into PPP funding that was available. You can read more about this report on 11alive.com. Rain finally moving out to the east. It's still really heavy over on the east side, over around Athens, moving down into parts of Oconee County near Watkinsville, where we have some heavy rain coming down. A little bit of lightning still left with this, but not as much as what we had earlier. Here's the system. This is what came through Atlanta a little bit earlier with some really heavy rain and uh, a, a lot of lightning with that too, and even some 40 mile an hour winds that stretched through Atlanta, up through North Fulton, and then through uh, Gwinnett County with some really heavy rain too. But there's that leading edge right now that is through Athens and, and over Athens, moving down toward Watkinsville. That's going to keep on moving toward Comer and Crawford and Enterprise over toward o Oglethorpe County and also Madison County. A few lighter showers up in Jackson County, but that lightning is right up here in the northern parts of Clark County and then close to the Oconee County line. And we only have about four strikes in the past 15 minutes. Really not a lot of lightning out there with that. Behind it, still a couple of lingering showers from Brazelton into Barrow County there just to the west of Winder. Also a little bit of heavy rain that is going into areas of Walton County from Eastern Gwinnett, but uh, that's just kind of some lingering rain back behind. These that we've been watching near Dalton are falling apart. And then we also have some showers and thunderstorms back into Birmingham. The models are indicating that that is also going to fall apart before it really makes it into West Georgia. Here's a live look in Athens right now. And, you know, we were watching this a little bit earlier as the sun was going down and we can see those rain shafts approaching from the west. You see a couple of raindrops there on the lens. And every once in a while we were seeing a couple of lightning flashes there at the distance. But now that that lightning is calming down, of course, we're not seeing as many of those strikes. Temperatures are down. Uh, we made it up into the lower 80s for highs today. Right now we're 76. Athens 71 with the rain cool there there. 73 in Gainesville. So it is kind of a comfortable night out there tomorrow. We're back up to 87 for a high a little warmer as the rain chances come down a little bit at about 40%. So we're just going to give that a six on the wasometer. All right. A lot of folks are talking about this, posting about it on social media. Yeah, there is the potential for some dr double trouble next week. We have Tropical Storm Laura that's going to be moving over the islands here uh, near Puerto Rico, U.S. Brit British Virgin Islands over the weekend and then through Cuba. Once this moves into the Gulf of Mexico, it is most likely going to become a hurricane. And then there's a Tropical Depression 17, uh, yeah, 17, 14 actually, that is down in the Caribbean right now that's going to move into the Gulf. This could also become a hurricane. We could have 
two hurricanes at the same time in the Gulf. That has never happened before. We've had two named systems in the Gulf before, but never two hurricanes at the same time. The uh, main uh, uh, developments that we've had today with this is that this track for Laura has shifted well over to the west. It's not really going up toward the Panhandle anymore. It's actually going toward Louisiana. And then the one, uh, trop the tropical depression that'll most likely be Marco is also shifting more to the west too. But a lot of people are spreading on social media and asking, um, you know, what could happen? Well, could these two storms collide? Well, let me go over some scenarios for you. As these two systems get into the Gulf, they could compete with each other and both of them could weaken. That's scenario number one. Scenario number two comes with the Fujiwara effect, which means that these storms could, if they're similar in size and strength, could actually rotate around or revolve around each other and then go in different directions. And they'll do somewhat of a tropical dance in the Gulf of Mexico. We'll wait and see if that happens. Here's another scenario. People are wondering if these could collide and then become a big superstorm. That answer is no. If one is a little bit bigger, it could actually rob all the energy and the other one could be absorbed into the bigger one, but it doesn't make that one any bigger because of it. So it's not like we could have them collide and then they become a huge storm. Uh, but again, it's something we're gonna be watching as we go into it next week. It could be interesting to watch out there. And then again, some of the models are showing one of them that could just totally fall apart. 40% chance for showers on Saturday and Sunday, uh, down to a 30% chance Monday. So not a washout for the weekend. We're just talking about the afternoon variety of scattered showers. Back to 40% Tuesday and Wednesday. Thursday and Friday, I'm bringing the rain chances back up, but that really depends on what happens with what is left of those tropical systems and if it sends any moisture or remnants our way. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. a market opening at Grady Hospital aimed at transforming the lives of patients, staff members and visitors. Our Bill Liss explains why it could be duplicated at other hospitals across the country. 
In a bold move, Grady Hospital has transformed an on-site fast food restaurant that closed in 2016 into a fresh market offering fruit, produce, and prepackaged meals to go. Both the Atlanta Community Food Bank and Open Hand are cooperating and working closely with Grady to bring healthy food to more than 7,000 Grady employees, to patients, and to visitors alike. For patients, there's an added benefit, nutritional classes and counseling. If you screen positive for food insecurity and have a diet-related illness, we're starting off with diabetes, uh, then you would get a, a prescription to the food pharmacy. And twice a month, you'd be able to come and pick up around 20 pounds of shelf-stable product as well as um, produce. Renee Ogan helps the patients get through the program, which expects to handle 2,500 people this year. They want to have different life, lifestyle changes. You know, they're just not in a position to actually do that. So for us to actually offer them that opportunity for up to a year, I feel like I don't know how more awesome it can get. And on the prepackaged side of Grady Market, Open Hand Executive Director Matt Piper says the food sells out just as fast as the shelves are stocked. It's quality food, high nutritional standards, no preservatives, freshly prepared in our Midtown kitchen every day. And that's the kind of food that people crave these days. The market is named the Jesse Hill Market after a leading Atlanta African-American insurance executive known for spending countless hours in a nearby church serving food to Atlanta's homeless. Still ahead, Georgia must do more to protect seniors. Still ahead on primetime, strong words from the White House as we look at what our nursing homes can do to stop the spread of COVID-19. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, Georgia's film industry is coming back to life. The state film office and a studio chief says pre-production on films and TV shows are reviving an industry that all but died with the beginning of the pandemic. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has a look at what's going on. 
At Southeast Atlanta's Black Hall studio, production workers quietly started returning to work about three weeks ago to begin the prep work for movies made by Marvel and Fox and a TV series on Netflix, titles all undisclosed. Right now, our on the ground is uh, producers, uh, their accounting teams, uh, there's some set builders, uh, but it's all the pre-production or the pre-principal photography guys that are on the ground getting started. Brian Millsap, Black Hall's chairman and CEO, says he expects on-set and on-scene shoots to start in earnest again in Georgia about a month from now. The state film office lists 29 titles now in production or pre-production in Georgia. One third of them feature films. I was trying to protect our family. Ozark, a Netflix show set in Missouri but shot in North Georgia, will reportedly start shooting again in November. Millsap says the state's cavernous studios and abundant outdoor space are ideal for social distancing and that new pandemic protocols are in use in the film industry. I think we've learned enough about this virus to know how to fight it and not have to just stay home and quarantine. Seems like your greatest fear is that some A-list star would get COVID in Georgia and those headlines would spread around the world. I think they're taking, you know, uh, very strong precautions with all of the actors and and working to keep them as isolated as possible and keep as few people on set as possible when we're filming. Millsap says Black Hall has installed a new air handling system similar to those used in hospitals. In a statement, Lee Thomas of the state film production office says studios seem to be filling up quickly and are really going above and beyond to keep their production safe, bringing a glimmer of light to a Georgia economy racked with grim news over the last 23 weeks. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. The Georgia Department of Health reporting more than 2,800 new cases of COVID in the state today. That number is slowly trending downward. However, we still rank among the highest rates of infection per capita in the country. Of concern, the number of additional deaths, 94 reported today. We know these figures lag several weeks behind. They are not reflecting a drop yet. Most of the deaths are among those with pre-existing conditions or older patients. In the midst of a pandemic, financial struggles are forcing two rural hospitals to close their doors. This in a part of our state where the number of ICU beds available to treat patients are already in the single digits. And community leaders fear this is just the beginning. 11 Alive's Brittany Klein Peter has a story. There are at least a dozen hospitals in rural Georgia that are going to close. This week, Northridge Medical Center announced it will be closing its doors. Three weeks ago, Southwest Georgia Regional Medical Center came to the same conclusion. Both hospitals will be closing in October, laying off over 100 employees, leaving the communities they serve in a difficult spot. Staff at Southwest Georgia Regional say that it has become increasingly difficult for small critical access hospitals to survive in rural areas, and that, quote, COVID-19 pushed the Cuthbert Hospital past the point of no return. The new Georgia project is a statewide initiative to help increase access to services for communities of color. The president of the organization warns these closures will take a toll on Georgia's poorest families. One of us is unprotected or one of us doesn't have access to health care, then none of us are safe. And none of us actually have access to health care. Health care lobbyist Monty Vizi cautions that rural hospitals are major economic engines for the communities and have experienced devastating losses due to COVID-19. Regardless of its size, is the economic engine in the community. Then when you that hospital closes, we've seen other business that have closed. Earlier this week, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services announced that the agency would give more than $35 million to states to support rural hospitals. But the worry is it's merely a Band-Aid. In a state where over 100 people are dying every day, uh, highlights and puts a fine point on the need for universal access to quality health care. According to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, a large number of uninsured and poor Georgians live in Randolph County, which is where Southwest Georgia Regional is located. It's also the same county that had the highest rate of infection in April of this year. 
I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Once again today, we had another round of showers and storms that moved through the area. Right now, I've got about 275 people on Facebook Live. We just got started and are starting the conversation here. So if you want to join that conversation, just go to my Facebook page, Chris Holcomb 11 Alive, and we can keep talking about not only weather that's going on now, but we're also going to talk about uh, what's going on in the tropics. But let me break this down for you right now, where we have that heavier rain that moved through Atlanta earlier. It's now well over to the east. It's pretty much pushing through Athens right now continuing to move on over to the east, but it was really heavy when it came through Atlanta earlier and it's been weakening somewhat as it pushes over away from us, but still some pockets of heavy rain in eastern parts of Clark County down into parts of Oconee County as well as into the northern parts of Morgan County. That's going to keep moving over into Madison and also Oglethorpe County. Not much lightning left with that. We had a, a lot more lightning with that earlier when it came through Atlanta. We are in this part now that is uh, drying out a little bit. A few showers near Dalton are falling apart, and then we're also going to watch this back in uh, uh, south and east of Birmingham. This is most likely going to fall apart too before it makes it into West Georgia. So I do think we'll see a break in the rain for the rest of the nighttime hours. Take a live look out there right now. This is how it looks in Athens. I know it's kind of dark there, but you can see a couple of raindrops on the lens. There's we're looking down at the government building in downtown. Still some rain coming down in Athens too. We were seeing lightning flashes in the distance here earlier, but now we don't see those anymore. And then look at this. A uh, nice rainbow after the rain came through. This is in Tucker from Travis Acona, one of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. Beautiful full rainbow there. And then Lauren Williams caught this in Lawrenceville. Very vivid colors there in that double rainbow that we have. Stay with us. I'm going to talk more about our rain chances for the weekend. And we have a lot to talk about with the tropics. So we'll have more on that coming up. 48 days. 48 days and still waiting for answers. The family of a little girl shot and killed on July 4th is reaching out to the community for help finding those responsible. Eight year old Sequoia Turner was fatally shot in southeast Atlanta. She was inside a car attempting to turn around near a protest site on University Avenue. There was a large crowd in the area and police released photos of several persons of interest. One was a teen and has been arrested on murder charges. He maintains his innocence today. An attorney for Sequoia's family announced three now billboards are in the area where she was killed. They are witnesses. They are asking witnesses to come forward, saying protecting children is not snitching. There's also a phone number for people to provide information anonymously. That number 1-866-969-2004. A Gwinnett police officer has been fired after an incident shown widely on social media. According to the police report, the officer was answering a call about property damage when an argument broke out between him and a woman outside a Loganville home. The social media video shows it escalated to the point where the officer tased the woman. Today, the Gwinnett police released the officer's body camera video from the incident. Come on, 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 Get on the ground right now. Taser, taser. The Gwinnett Police Department says the arrest of Kendesha Smith was justified, as was the use of force. However, they also say Officer Michael Oxford did not live up to their policy of acting in a kind and considerate manner, so they fired him. We will continue to follow this story and have more on 11alive.com and on Up Late tonight at 11. Last night, the Democratic Party wrapped up the four day long DNC. Most of it presented virtually with no live crowds due to COVID-19. Monday, the Republican National Convention begins in a similar format. Joe Henke has more on why the tone of the RNC may sound different. During the DNC, the party's top names from the Obamas to the Clintons and of course, Senator Kamala Harris and former Vice President Joe Biden talked with a sense of urgency and often went directly at President Donald Trump. One political analyst I talked with today said he expects the Republicans to spend their convention pitching a different America. During a Democratic National Convention that featured many taped moments and speeches, the Democrats showed a blueprint for a convention that avoided any major gaffes or errors. While President Donald Trump and the Republican Party may follow suit in some ways, the message being delivered is expected to be different. 11 Alive political analyst and GOP consultant Mike Hassinger says. The emphasis is going to be on uh, we have made America great. America is great. They'll talk about hope. They'll talk about opportunity. They'll talk about heroes. And, and you're going to see much more, I suspect, much more positivity than negativity 
coming out of the GOP convention. No interest in treating the presidency as anything but one more reality show that he can use to get the attention he craves. Hessinger says the Democrats often went directly at President Trump. He believes the Republicans will be a bit more backhanded with their attacks. I've done X and Y and Z and I've accomplished all these things. We'll say President Trump has, has done this unlike his predecessors who were here for 50 years and couldn't get it done. We have done this. We have done that. And from Stacey Abrams to Sally Yates and Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, the DNC featured several prominent Democrats from Georgia in key speaking roles. Now, the Republicans yet to release their full speaker list for the RNC, but so far, no Republicans from Georgia have been named as RNC speakers. Fulton County election officials busy preparing for a September special election to fill the remaining months of the late Congressman John Lewis's term. Today, the Fulton Board of Election approved six early voting locations. There are seven candidates on next month's ballot. Voters will choose their next full term representative in a different election in November. Throughout this election year, count on our 11 Alive political team to bring you analysis and perspective on the issues impacting you and your family. If you see something we should cover, email us where ATO speaks at 11alive.com. All she wanted was to put her brother to rest, but she had to ask the suspect in his death to do it. Next, how a deputy helped her through the painful process. And don't forget, we're streaming for you right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. Uncertainty. Some things become more clear. The things we take for granted. The people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently. Alive uncovered new documents that reveal reasons behind the resignation of the Johns Creek Police Chief. Christopher Byers stepped down from the police department earlier this month. Byers was asked to resign after an internal investigation confirmed inappropriate sexual language directed at a female employee. The incident happened before he was named chief and later made a public post on social media criticizing the Black Lives Matter movement. Johns Creek paid the police chief $325,000 in confidential agreements. The same day, city council voted to raise property taxes. Buyers agreed not to sue or disparage the city, and the city would not disparage him. As of now, we don't know about the female employee. Her name is redacted from the documents. The most recent White House Coronavirus Task Force report says Georgia must do more to protect seniors. 28% of our nursing homes have at least one COVID positive resident. That is more than double the national average of 12%. Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom asking nursing homes, what's it going to take to stop the spread? Several times a week, the Department of Community Health publishes this COVID report, giving us a glimpse into what's happening inside our long-term care facilities. Westbury Medical Care in Butts County leads the state in the number of deaths with 34. Glenwood Health and Rehabilitation in DeKalb has the most reported cases between residents and staff, 
185. While we have centers on lockdowns from visitation, uh, we still have the staff that work there, uh, the deliveries that are made to the centers. Tony Marshall, president of Georgia Healthcare Association, says these facilities merely mirror the rise and fall of COVID in the community outside their walls. So we plotted them both. The green bars are cases statewide. The orange cases in long-term care. Because of gaps in reporting, it's hard to compare, but there does appear a correlation. Best practice recommendations by the CDC and CMS are that we do weekly uh, surveillance testing of all staff. What percentage of facilities would you say are actually doing that? I would say virtually none. Yet testing is exactly what this White House task force says we need. It recommends routine weekly testing of all workers. Marshall says biweekly testing probably makes more sense, but either way, it's not consistently happening. Capacity and cost may be to blame. We've estimated for a single round of testing for assisted living staff to cost a little over $1.8 million and for nursing center staff to cost a little over $4.2 million. So to do it every week until the end of the year would cost nearly $200 million. And that's nationally? No, that's just in the state of Georgia. A spokesperson for Glenwood Health says after its outbreak, the facility traced the virus back to asymptomatic residents and staff. That's why all 13 of the nursing homes represented by Sava Senior Care have decided to buy their own test kits to test staff and residents weekly when there's an outbreak. But they wait in line for those results, just like the rest of us. We're simply back at a stage we were in April and early May in regards to getting test results where we might actually be desiring to do another round of testing before we have results back from the last round of testing. The federal government is sending testing devices to every skilled nursing facility so that they can run faster, cheaper tests on site. According to the governor's office, Georgia is a priority and we've received 80 of these devices so far, but they will not help assisted living facilities or personal care homes, which are regulated by the state. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers on Facebook. I still have about 300 people watching right now. We're talking about the tropics, talking about the rain chances for the weekend. Uh, Kimley Couch is asking if those storms will strengthen. Um, other folks are saying hello. Michael Baxter says thanks for the weather updates you give us every day. So some people are also sharing the love on a Friday night. But let me show you what we're watching on radar. This down south, these are false echoes. Don't worry about that being rain. We're watching mainly this that is pushed over to the east. That was all the rain that came through Atlanta earlier earlier that was really heavy and had a lot of thunder and lightning with it and gusty winds as well. As it moved off to the east, it was still pretty heavy, but at least it is weakening somewhat. We still have this heavy rain that's moving out of Clark County, out of Oconee County, into parts of Madison and Oglethorpe County, also down to the south from Morgan County, near the Greene County area as well, where we just have some good rain coming through. Not as much lightning with it, just a couple lightning strikes there just to the uh, east of the Clark County line. And as you look elsewhere over North Georgia, we had a few showers near Dalton that are falling apart. We're also keeping an eye on these coming out of um, Alabama near Anniston. Some showers. These could make it into Cleburne and Randolph, but I really think they're going to weaken as they move into West Georgia a little bit later on. So I'm not overly concerned about those. Now, let me take you out there live right now. I know just a minute ago I showed you this live camera out of Athens. And um, then you can see here that there are a couple of drops on the radar on the um, on the lens there as the rain has pretty much moved out of Athens, but it was pretty heavy in that area just a little while ago. Now take a look at this picture. This is from earlier this afternoon from one of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers, Michelle Atkins in McDonough, and this is a halo around the sun where these clouds here are thicker, but then in the upper levels, look at these high, thin, wispy clouds. Those are made out of ice crystals and it refracted or would bend the sunlight into this halo. So that was a, a beautiful picture that she sent us a little bit earlier as well. Tomorrow we're going to start off dry and then in the afternoon it's not going to be widespread, but we'll have a few scattered showers that'll be with us during the day with high temperatures back up into the upper 80s. You can see tonight that rain moving out and then uh, tomorrow morning starting off dry. In the afternoon, lunchtime, a mix of sun and clouds. And then in those afternoon hours, not widespread, but we'll see some scattered showers that'll be moving through a couple of those into the evening hours. And then on Sunday, pretty much the same thing, a dry start 
and then a few scattered afternoon showers. Both days will have about a 40% chance for that, and then those will diminish in the evening hours as well. Now, let me break down the tropics. We have two tropical systems we're watching. This one is Tropical Storm Laura, uh, which is right there near the Leeward Islands, and then we have a Tropical Depression 14, uh, which is uh, moving away here. Uh, it's in, in the Western Caribbean, and it will be moving into the Gulf of Mexico next week. Now, it's possible we could have two systems in the Gulf at the same time next week. This is Laura going to be moving over uh, the U.S. and British Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico over the weekend. And they do have a tropical storm warnings there also for Haiti and Dominican Republic. Watch what happens when this system gets into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, by m Monday and Tuesday, it's going to change over, we think, into a hurricane. Now, this track has shifted more to the west. Yesterday, it looked like it could go up into the Florida Panhandle. Now it's moving more to the west. But a lot can change with this because there are two systems that could interact with each other. This one most likely will come in, maybe become a hurricane hurricane briefly and then be a tropical storm as it moves into the Texas coast uh, on Tuesday as well. And um, I have on our website and on my Facebook page an explanation of what would happen if those two storms came together. And it's not like what you're reading on Facebook for, or, or online from a lot of sources saying it's going to be a super mega storm or anything like that. Uh, so check that out on my Facebook page and we'll explain that during the evening hours as well. So here's what we're watching uh, for the seven, next seven days. We're going to see those scattered showers. That'll be with us tomorrow. 40% chance for those showers Saturday and Sunday highs in the 80s and then a 30% chance for showers on Monday back to a 40% chance as we get into uh, Tuesday uh, as well or actually Thursday and Friday and then into the weekend uh, actually Thursday and Friday we're going to see those rain chances that are going to come up a little bit more that all depends on what happens with the remnants of those tropical systems and if it's still going to be able to send any moisture our way. A grieving woman and a deputy bond over the pain of losing loved ones to violence. This was a heartbreaking story. A woman had to beg the suspect in her brother's death for the right to bury him. But as Latasha Givens reports, an unexpected encounter led to healing. I get emotional even thinking about the care that they took with me. Erin Zachary is talking about the deputies who helped her during a very difficult time. She lost her brother, Brett, after police say he was stabbed to death by his wife, Roxanne. But in order to bury Brett, Georgia law requires the body be released to next of kin. In this case, that meant his wife. Aaron went from the Gwinnett County Courthouse to the jail, trying to get the proper documents to get her brother's body. When I got to the jail, I didn't really have much hope that this would work. It was my last shot. I went in and they listened. They did not cut me off. They didn't dis dismiss me. And that's when she met Deputy John Franklin, who started giving her directions. He said, better yet, I'm going with you. I said, hey, listen, you know, I know what you're going through personally because two months ago, I just lost my brother. Deputy Franklin's baby brother, Ryan, was also murdered. And in that moment when Aaron shared with you what happened to her, what did that feel like sharing that space at that time? <sighs> it, it took me back. It took me, it took me there. So I knew exactly how she felt. It's, it's very painful. Um, I would have never imagined in a million years that I would have lost my younger brother. There's some times where I just think about, um, you know, my brother and just calling him. Erin needed her brother's wife to sign the paperwork, so Deputy know. Franklin stayed with her while another deputy went to get the signature. Erin says Franklin stayed with her until the papers were signed. Once it was signed, they sent it back to me, gave me their condolences. He even, you know, gave me a little bit of counsel and it said, you know, this will pass and you will get through this. They went above and beyond their job today because that's definitely not their job. Like many of our deputies, she's just a very caring, empathetic person who really genuinely wants to serve others. And that service comes in many different forms sometimes. Shannon Volkadoff says Deputy Franklin was also part of a team of deputies who saved a man who tried to jump off their second floor building after an unfavorable court hearing just a few weeks ago. I can't even explain to you what it meant, how much compassion they showed me and how you know helpful they were. So to come, a hospital chaplain helping comfort families in some of their darkest hours finds new ways to inspire hope and help. Extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. A chaplain at Emory Midtown spends his days comforting COVID-19 patients and their families. He carries that perspective everywhere he goes, and it's why he is using every avenue he has to encourage people to do their part to help. Cheryl Preheim has a story. Still not understanding what's going on, but it's very important that we take care of each other because we see it every day. In all the time you've been a chaplain, this is by far the most challenging time you've seen. Yes, this is very tough. When I'm in the hospital, we are there with the patients and with the doctors and with the family members every single day watching their family members die. And if people really truly understood how devastating it is to different families, because a lot of people are saying it's not affecting me or my family, so I'm not really worried about it. People need to wake up. This is not over. Chaplain Joseph Smith is using his other passion, music, to share his experience and a plea. There is ministry that we that must be done, but at the same time, we want to have, have fun, but also put a message out there as well. He says little things like social distancing, wearing masks, would save so many regrets he hears about in hospital rooms. I wish I would have stayed home. I wish I wouldn't have gone to that bar. And I've heard it personally, and it just hurts me to my heart that we have to keep hearing these conversations. You've also spent a lot of time with the staff because it's taken a great toll over many months now for them too. First responders are tired and they need rest. Burnt out, more equipment to feeling depressed, not understanding how long this is going to be. He'll keep ministering in hospital rooms and through music, through this crazy storm. always praying that people will come together. Let's be here for each other during this time. Chaplain Smith at Emory JS3 at his Christian record label, uh, Jehovah Jams. You can find his song and more of his story on 11alive.com. Colleges across the country are trying to go on with in-person learning and keep COVID-19 transmission down. We're getting a look at some of the contact tracing technology that they hope will let students stay on campus. Weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. First day of fall semester looks like for students at UGA. Spaced out desks, mask on, and students ready to learn. UGA community members are encouraged to log any symptoms of COVID-19 every day before coming to campus using an app. Students are also required to log any positive COVID-19 test. Universities across the country are trying to figure out how to continue with classes safely. Some have already seen pitfalls. At Oklahoma State University, a sorority house is already under quarantine for the exposure after week one. But the administration is stepping up its efforts to wipe out the virus, including advanced contact tracing. NBC's Morgan Chesky got an exclusive look at the technology in action. Colleges and universities changing course nationwide, halting in-person classes after COVID outbreaks and scenes of packed parties like this at Villanova, University of North Georgia, and this scene near Oklahoma State University just before school started. Over the weekend, an off-campus sorority house quarantined with 23 members testing positive. The school is hoping to keep more than 23,000 students safe with a high-tech solution to contact tracing. Something that uses everything from course attendance to card swaps to campus purchases to most importantly, Wi-Fi on the students' phones when they set foot on campus. To see how this technology works, we follow Jared Moore for a day in the life of a college freshman. Leaving his fraternity house, Jared heads towards campus. First stop, the student union to buy a snack. I got some milk. No better way to start the day. Thank you. Then it's off to class. We're just starting class. Yeah, we're all social distancing. Um, okay. Afterwards, a quick stop at the library. A short break at a pet therapy event. Otis, shake. Hey, boy. boy. Finally, lunchtime, where Jared goes off campus. Then an afternoon gym sesh before heading back to his fraternity house. Got some guys hanging out in here. Oh, what's up, Jerry? <laughs> the next day, a look behind a high-tech curtain. He had class in that building. You can see student union. There was a food purchase, so that's a card swipe. Dr. Christy Hawkins oversees the contact tracing technology. What we can see, of course, is the buildings that he was in. Those are the ones that are highlighted in orange. But you can also see the possible contact locations. With more than 5,000 Wi-Fi hotspots around campus, Hawkins says they can know exactly where a sick student may have been. What this basically tells us is the buildings he was in for at least 15 minutes throughout the day. And 
specifically where in those buildings and he was. And where in those buildings. So if I go into the library, you're not only going to be able to say, uh, I was on the first floor, but I was on this side of the building in the first floor. Here's who I could have come into contact with. Yes. But when it comes to off campus, we would not be able to track that. So this is limited to on campus activity. As for having their activity tracked, students have mixed feelings. It feels like, you know, we're kind of like being spied on, but not really. If it helps us with COVID and keeps everybody safe from the harmful effects of it, then I'm all for it. The university's president stressing the information gathered is private. I mean, we've got lots of information on everybody on our campus, but we don't distribute it. We don't share it with anybody. To already have more than 20 members of an OSU sorority testing positive, a house under quarantine, do you feel prepared? It worked the way it was supposed to work. Everybody that was involved in recruitment was tested and they were negative, but somebody came in that was positive. For students, educators, and university leaders, navigating this pandemic might just be the toughest class yet. More than 300 UGA faculty and staff signed a letter calling in-person learning, quote, unwise because of the state's high transmission rate. You can learn more about that letter on 11alive.com. Tracking showers finally moving out of our area. They moved out of Atlanta a little bit earlier, and now they're just to the east of Athens, and they'll continue moving eastward. Uh, they'll get closer to the South Carolina, Georgia border in just a little while, still with some heavy rain and thunder and lightning, but we are drying out now. That's after those showers came through here. They were really heavy over Atlanta and on the north side, North Fulton and the Cobb County, really heavy rain, then into Gwinnett, and then it started weakening somewhat. Still pockets of heavy rain, but just not as strong as it was earlier, and now this is what it it's left now east of Athens, uh, moving through parts of uh, Morg uh, Madison County, also Oglethorpe County, a little bit of this down into uh, just out of Morgan County and into Greene County, and it'll move on over into Elberton, also around Hartwell. We've got about five lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes, so it's not as much as what we had earlier. And as you widen out a little more, you see that moving away. Still watching some of these showers back into Alabama. We really think these are going to weaken as they move into West Georgia. Cleburne and Randolph, you might get a few of those showers as they continue that weakening process. Take a live look out there right now. This is our tower cam in Rome where the roads have dried out after the rain that came through a little bit earlier. Also a little bit of a breeze, but with some nice comfortable temperatures in the 70s right now. Stay with us. We'll talk about our rain chances for the weekend and what to expect in the tropics in just a few minutes. Tonight, 11 Alive wants to shine the spotlight on race in America and the words we use when protesters take the streets demanding police reform. Some pivot that conversation to black on black crime. But does the phrase unfairly perpetuate racism? Here's Reveal investigator Andy Parati. When a black man dies at the hands of law enforcement, outrage on the street often follows, but so does another narrative. 93% of blacks in America are killed by other blacks. Why is there not the outrage when there's black on black violence? Black on black crime, a catchphrase some believe conservatives use to distract from police brutality. And it makes so bad, it's black on black crime. A phrase also recently used by Doherty County Coroner Michael Fowler after a rise in homicides near Albany, this past May. Nobody's saying anything. Like it's just something they're pushing up under the rug. Not so, says Clifton Crowley. He says black communities are talking about it. The media just isn't paying attention. Crowley is the community chair for the Atlanta NAACP. There's always been a deep level of concern for violence and, and poverty and crime within our community. The licensed social worker points to a long list of local and national organizations focused on reducing violence in black communities, including street groomers, 100 black men of Atlanta, and former President Barack Obama's My Brother's Keepers initiative. You have to look beyond the race. Rodney Bryant is Atlanta's interim police chief. He doesn't dispute violence in black communities is a problem. In Atlanta, 81% of victims to violent crimes were black in 2018. Nearly 90% of people arrested for those crimes were black too. But Bryant argues violence is often a side effect of generational racism, which has created a health, wealth, and education gap. I think it does do the black community a disservice when you say it's a 
black on black crime because now you're saying it's just a black problem. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the majority of violent crime happens within the same race. A 2018 national survey found offenders were within the same race as the victim 70% of the time for blacks, 62% for whites. Here again is the Doherty County Corner speaking with 11 Alive's Faith Abube. Have you ever used the term white on white crime or Hispanic on Hispanic crime? No, if I see it, I'll see it. I just call a spade a spade. If I'm calling for black people who use that term, I want you to think about the systematic racism that has occurred in this country and the effects of taking out three million black faces, incarcerating them, and releasing them back into the community. Professor Brown says black communities are typically over policed which increases the number of black arrests, even when departments have a high number of black officers. APD interim police chief Rodney Bryan says Atlanta changed its response strategy years ago to focus on directing responses based on call volume and population. You can tune in to our sister station 11 Alive on Wednesday night at 9 for an 11 Alive special Equality Matters will examine social injustice and systemic racial inequalities in our community. Two nurses are now on administrative leave following the death of a man while in custody at the Cobb County Jail. You have to go! You have to go! This comes after the community rallied for justice outside the jail. They want the district attorney to launch a criminal investigation into Cavell Wingo's death. 11 Alive's exclusive reveal investigation uncovered a 2019 video of Wingo pleading for medical help inside the jail. But instead of bringing him to the hospital, jail staff put him alone in a padded room where he died. Wingo's family, the NAACP and the ACLU and State Representative David Wilkerson are all calling for action. Everyone ignored his cries for pain. That has to stop. It is time for this Cobb County District Attorney to take our pleas seriously and to listen to Kevin Wingo and his family for the first time. We all saw the video. I don't think anybody thinks that video is acceptable. The Cobb County District Attorney's Office says it is reviewing records related to Wingo's death. More than 18,000 Georgia businesses were approved for PPP loans, but some of Metro Atlanta's wealthiest areas got the most money. A look at the new report next. Practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. 
Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice. Atlanta's wealthiest zip codes got the most money in PPP loans, according to a new report from our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle. PPP loans were created through the CARES Act to help small businesses that were suffering because of the pandemic. Data from the Small Business Administration shows that the top 10 zip codes approved for the most loans, six of them are some of the wealthiest in the metro area. Here is a snapshot of some of the zip codes we're talking about that were approved for the most loans. The zip code approved for the most was 30339 near Vinings and Cobb and Fulton counties. That lands at number 20 on the list of wealthiest zip codes. The top 25 wealthiest zip codes account for nearly a third of the loans paid out. The top 10 are all less than 12% black. Only two majority black zip codes were approved for more than 100 of these same loans. We talked to Peter Roberts. He's a professor at Emory who has studied small businesses for years, including lending patterns. He says this is a deeply rooted structural problem that goes beyond PPP loans. The pattern that you see through the PPP period is exactly the same pattern as you see from 2010 to 2017. So the idea of sort of post previous meltdown, you had this fairly dramatic two-ish to one disparity that's replicated with the PPP. Um, so the first thing you think is that it's probably something that's longer and deeper than just what happened during this program. According to the Business Chronicle, compared to majority white zip codes, majority black areas in the U.S. miss out on about $1.1 million in SBA loans every year. Robert says fixing the problem is going to take policy changes and creativity. Uh, you know, you can't ask the SBA to do something now that it was unable to do, you know, for 2010 to 17, which is stimulate kind of businesses before they see them. Um, and so I think we need something else to go back and say, how do we create an on-ramp where the entrepreneurial capacity in this neighborhood can grow from informal to formal? So you've got the two, three, four, five employees, right? Then you've got the relationships with the kind of SBA lenders. And next time this comes up, we kind of have, you know, a more balanced systems and structures so that next time something horrible happens, we can deal with it better. Previous reporting from the Business Chronicle shows a lot of minority business owners did not tap into PPP funding that was available. You can read more about this report on 11alive.com. Well, we're trying to dry out a little bit here in Atlanta after this heavy rain came through earlier today. That was around 5, 6 o'clock tonight when it came through Atlanta, and now it's pushing off to the east, and it's now east of Athens where they still have some of that heavier rain that's about to move into uh, Elbert County, also into Hart County, and right there along the Georgia-South Carolina line. The heaviest stuff is near Madison County, also into Oglethorpe County around Enterprise, and again, about to cross over the line into Elbert County. Not as much lightning with it as we had earlier. Right now, we still have about 5 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes and I think that was mainly like 13 to 15 minutes ago. We haven't seen as many lightning strikes since then. In Atlanta, we're drying out. We're still watching some showers back into Alabama, but the trend is that these are going to diminish as they get closer to us. Cleburne and Randolph County, Alabama, you might get in on some of that, but I think they're going to be falling apart before they get into West Georgia. Let me show you what else we're watching outside right now. This is a live look in Noonan, where we have uh, drying out conditions there as well, and a nice view at the courthouse where we have comfortable temperatures in the 70s right now, thanks to that rain-cooled air. So it's really a comfortable evening out there if you don't mind the ground most likely still being wet in many areas. In fact, look at these temperatures 73 here. Peachtree City is 74, LaGrange 75, 75 in Thomaston, mainly lower 70s around Metro Atlanta and on the west side 70 in Carrollton and Marietta Canton 70 Athens is 70 with the rain cool there there too and then 72 up in Dalton at this hour tomorrow. It is going to be a little warmer than it was out there today. We only got up into the lower 80s for a high today. 
We will be warmer tomorrow as we'll see a few more breaks in the clouds to give us a little more sunshine here and there and fewer showers in the afternoon. We're going with about a 40% chance for showers tomorrow. We'll, we'll give that a six on the wasometer. That's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. We're watching that rain move out of here tonight, and then tomorrow morning we start off with uh, some sunshine mixing in with a few clouds around. At lunchtime, still that mix of sun and clouds, but really no rain for the first part of the day. It's in the afternoon hours when we see some heating and that moisture in place, giving us just a few scattered showers, but it's really not a widespread coverage of rain. And then the same thing for Sunday starting off dry, but then in the afternoon, some of those scattered showers will be moving through the area. And of course, we're going to be watching the tropics very closely as we see two tropical systems right here moving through the Leeward Islands or right there at the Leeward Islands is a uh, is our tropical storm uh, that we have out there, tropical storm Laura, and also tropical depression 14 right over here. Both of these are expected to move into the Gulf of Mexico next week. We put both of these forecast tracks maps on here at the same time, so you can see what we're watching. Through the weekend, it will be impacting some of the islands like Puerto Rico, U.S. and British Virgin Islands, where we have tropical storm warnings in effect, and then Haiti, Dominican Republic going through Cuba, and then as it moves west of Florida in the Gulf, we think this will become a hurricane at the same time. Tropical Tropical Depression 14 becomes Tropical Storm Marco. That could be a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. We could have two hurricanes at the same time in the Gulf. A lot can change, though, between now and then. These storms coming close together, uh, this one goes into the coast of Texas, and then Laura could become into the North Gulf Coast uh, region here once we get into uh, Wednesday. This track has been pushing more to the west, so it's really going to be interesting to see how these storms interact with each other. And we have another system that we're watching off the coast of Africa. This one had better chances yesterday, but now it's encountering some shear and dry air, so the percentages are coming down to 30% chance of development over the next five days. So we'll keep a really close eye on all of these systems and whether or not we'll have any impacts here. 40% chance for showers for the weekend. We're talking about the afternoon and evening variety of showers and thunderstorms, down to a 30% chance Monday, back to 40% Tuesday and Wednesday. And then these rain chances on Thursday and Friday, these are really going to depend on what happens with those tropical systems and whether or not it's going to be able to spread any Gulf moisture or any tropical remnants our way. There's a market opening at Grady Hospital aimed at transforming the lives of patients, staff members and visitors. Bill List explains why it could be duplicated at other hospitals across America. In a bold move, Grady Hospital has transformed an on-site fast food restaurant that closed in 2016 into a fresh market offering fruit, produce and prepackaged meals to go. Both the Atlanta Community Food Bank and Open Hand are cooperating and working closely with Grady to bring healthy food to more than 7,000 Grady employees, to patients and to visitors alike. For patients, there's an added benefit, nutritional classes and counseling. If you screen positive for food insecurity and have a diet related illness, we're starting off with diabetes, uh, then you would get a, a prescription to the food pharmacy and twice a month you'd be able to come and pick up around 20 pounds of shelf stable product as well as um, produce. Renee Ogan helps the patients get through the program which expects to handle 2,500 people this year. They want to have different life, lifestyle changes you know they're just not in a position to actually do that so for us to actually offer them that opportunity for up to a year I feel like I don't know how more awesome it can get. And on the prepackaged side of Grady Market, Open Hand Executive Director Matt Piper says the food sells out just as fast as the shelves are stocked. It's quality food, high nutritional standards, no preservatives, freshly prepared in our Midtown kitchen every day. And that's the kind of food that people crave these days. The market is named the Jesse Hill Market after a leading Atlanta African-American insurance executive known for spending countless hours in a nearby church serving food to Atlanta's homeless. Prime time weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Next month, viewers can watch new shows from Atlanta's Tyler Perry. BET announced season seven of his House of Pain, plus the premiere of the new series, Tyler Perry's Assisted Living. Perry made national headlines when he resumed production at his Atlanta studios earlier this year. He created a coronavirus bubble with everyone living on site, extensive COVID testing and other safety measures. Looks like it worked. The hope of connecting more people to more green space becomes a reality after years of planning and fundraising today. The South Fork Conservary, uh, Conservary saw its 175 foot pedestrian bridge go up in Buckhead. It took one of the largest cranes in North America to lift the massive structure into place. Once you add the accessibility ramps, it's nearly as long as a football field. The bridge is between Piedmont Road and Lindbergh Drive. It connects neighborhoods to acres of green space and nature trails. Rain chances down a little bit Saturday and Sunday. We're back to the afternoon and evening variety of showers and storms and highs right around 87 Saturday, 86 on Sunday. Only a 30% chance Monday and then back to 40% Tuesday and Wednesday. The rain chances for Thursday and Friday are really going to depend on what happens with those tropical systems that will be in the Gulf of Mexico. Depending on those tracks, that will determine whether or not we get any Gulf moisture moving our way. But we do think right now we will have some better chances by the end of next week. All right, stick around. More news and weather coming up in prime time in the 10 o'clock hour, and we'll see you on 11 Alive for Up Late at 11. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people, or are you doing this to make money, or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have... 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. A mother desperate for answers in the murder of her eight-year-old child puts up billboards Around Atlanta, we hear from her tonight. A woman is dead and at least six others are recovering after carbon monoxide exposure. What emergency crews at the scene say happened. Plus, TV and movie production in Georgia now picking back up amid the pandemic. The safety precautions studios are taking to keep actors and crew safe. New tonight, 11 Alive uncover new documents that reveal reasons behind the resignation of the Johns Creek Police Chief. Christopher Byers stepped down from the police department earlier this month. Byers was asked to resign after an internal investigation confirmed inappropriate sexual language directed at a female employee. The incident happened before he was named chief and later made public a public post on social media criticizing the Black Lives Matter movement. Johns Creek paid the police chief $325,000 in a confidential agreement. The same day, city council voted to raise property taxes. Buyers agreed to not to sue or disparage the city, and the city would not disparage him. As of now, we don't know about the female employee. Her name is redacted from the documents. A Gwinnett County police officer is out of a job tonight after video of this arrest went viral, raking up more than a million views. It shows the officer using a taser on a woman before arresting her. But Natisha Lance explains that's not why this officer has been fired. On the, ground. the Gwinnett County Police Department released this body camera video Friday. You can see Officer Michael Oxford using his taser on Kandesia Smith outside her mom's Loganville home. The jolt knocked the 22-year-old off her feet and into the bushes. The officer said Smith did not follow commands and resisted arrest. It all started when Officer Michael Oxford was called out to a neighbor's home on Tuesday. The neighbor claimed two people threw a bottle at her car and threatened her nine-year-old son. Smith was arrested for obstruction of an officer and simple battery. But in a twist, after reviewing the case, Gwinnett County Police fired Officer Oxford. We don't believe that Officer Oxford practiced what we have taught him with proper de-escalation techniques. That being coupled with the violations of our conduct policies. Use of the taser was within the department's policy. Officer Oxford was on the force for just over a year. In that time, the department says he'd had previous conduct infractions. Kendisha Smith is out of jail tonight, and those charges against her will remain. 
New video tonight shows the moment a driver crashed into a police cruiser. Oh. Whoa, you see it right there. You can see here the impact knocked a Dunwoody oh. police officer flat on his feet. The crash slammed the officer into a woman he just pulled over. You can see her flipping over the guardrail. This happened over the weekend on I-285. Somehow there were no serious injuries. Dunwoody police hope that this serves as a reminder to move over if you see an officer on the side of the road. A woman is dead, at least six others recovering from carbon monoxide exposure in Milton. Investigators say a car was left running inside a garage at one of the townhomes on Regatta Grove yesterday morning. We have not confirmed the name of the woman who died. However, neighbors tell us she was a teacher at Cambridge High School. Well, all the stormy weather we had out there today is heading east now. Chris, what can we expect? Do we get a quiet night ahead? Well, I, I do think we'll have a quiet night and also a quiet first part of the day tomorrow. You know, where today we had showers off and on at any time. We had some this morning. We had some this afternoon. Tomorrow, we're going back to that pattern of the afternoon and evening variety. You can see the showers that came through our area earlier today, and they were heavy with a lot of good rain there and some thunder and lightning. And then that moved through Gwinnett. And then now it's to the east of Athens. We're seeing the last little bit move through uh, near Elberton right now, still with some heavy rain through parts of of Oglethorpe County as well, uh, but we're not seeing any more lightning with this, and this is going to continue in that weakening process as it moves over toward the South Carolina line. Only about five lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes, and that's really diminishing. We are dry now. We are watching some showers that are out to the west in parts of Alabama. Some of those will make it into Cleburne and Randolph County, Alabama, but I really think these will be weakening as they move into West Georgia, so I'm not overly concerned about a big time rain threat overnight. Here's a live look in Coweta County where they're trying to dry out there as well. Uh, they didn't have as many showers on the south side today as we had here in Metro Atlanta. Stay with us. We'll talk more about those rain chances for tomorrow. We'll time that out for you for those afternoon and evening plans that you might have. And we're also going to take you down into the tropics where we could have double trouble making it into the Gulf of Mexico next week. Now to the latest in the coronavirus pandemic. According to the CDC, COVID-19 is now the third leading cause of death in the United States. The Georgia Department of Health reporting more than 2,800 new cases in the state today. That number slowly trending downward. However, we still rank among the highest rates of infection per capita in the country. Of concern, the number of additional deaths, 94 reported today. We know these figures lag several weeks behind. They are not reflecting a drop yet. Most of the deaths are among those with pre-existing conditions or older patients. Floyd County Schools now reversing its decision to go all virtual. Yesterday, we told you the entire district would go virtual until September 8th. Today, a district spokesperson confirmed that it is no longer the case except at Coosa High School and middle schools and Pepperell Elementary, which have been the hardest hit by COVID-19 cases. We are working to learn more about this sudden change from the administration. If you have any questions about the school district's plans for fall or their policies to keep students safe, we have a complete breakdown for you at 11alive.com. A message from a grieving mother tonight for anyone who knows something about who shot her eight year old daughter, Sequoia Turner, to death. Sequoia's mother put up her own billboards pleading for people to come forward with tips to help solve the case. John Chirik, live in Atlanta, talked with the mother tonight and has more on this case, which has just been so, so awful for so long. The billboards, the mother's hope. Her message and prayer to the crowds of people who were there that night who might have seen who shot and killed her eight year old daughter. Billboards just south of downtown Atlanta. In Sequoia Turner's words, I was eight years old when I was murdered. Protecting children is not snitching. Help my family identify who killed me. Sequoia's mother, Charmaine Turner, tells me the family came up with $5,000 to pay for two billboards for a month near where Sequoia was shot to death on University Avenue last month because no one is coming forward yet. With everything that's going on, they don't want to talk to the police, but 
an innocent child and family was brought into this matter. So why not speak up and come forward when it's the right thing to do? On that night, on July 4th, Charmaine Turner had pulled off the interstate just south of downtown Atlanta, trying to turn around. She was at University in Pryor, near the Wendy's, where Rayshard Brooks was shot to death by an Atlanta police officer in June. The site of many demonstrations since, and a crowd of people confronted her. Police now say several people shot into the car, killing Sicoria. It was multiple shots into that car. I mean, it's just... It's horrific. Family attorney Mawuli Davis says apart from the one person who surrendered, who denies he fired any shots, others who were in the crowd must know some bit of information that could help police find all of the people who did fire shots at the car. Step up, because this is a daughter of our community, and her life truly mattered. Sicoria would be just starting third grade now. Just to interact with all the kids, just to play, and she's just happy, always happy. The reward, up to $50,000. They just can't imagine the people who were responsible just walking freely. Atlanta police tell me that detectives are working this case every day, and they need help, hoping people will contact Crime Stoppers with anonymous tips for Sicoria and her family. Fulton County election officials are busy preparing for a September special election to fill the remaining months of the late Congressman John Lewis's term. Today, the Fulton Board of Elections approved six early voting locations. There are seven candidates on next month's ballot. Voters will choose their next full term representative in a different election coming up in November. Throughout this election year, count on our 11 Alive political team to bring you analysis and perspective on the issues impacting you and your family. If you see something out there that you think that we should cover, shoot us an email. We're ATO Speaks at 11alive.com. All she wanted was to put her brother to rest, but she had to ask the suspect in his death to be able to do it. Next, how a deputy helped her through this painful process. Coming up in the next half hour, the DNC in the books and the RNC right around the corner. NBC's Chuck Todd is breaking it all down for us. A symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect. A grieving woman and a deputy bond over the pain of losing loved ones through violence. This was a heartbreaking story. A woman who had to beg the suspect in her brother's death for the right to bury him. But as Latasha Givens reports, an unexpected encounter led to healing. I get emotional even thinking about the care that they took with me. Erin Zachary is talking about the deputies who helped her during a very difficult time. She lost her brother, Brett, after police say he was stabbed to death by his wife, Roxanne. But in order to bury Brett, Georgia law requires the body be released to next of kin. In this case, that meant his wife. Erin went from the Gwinnett County Courthouse to the jail, trying to get the proper documents to get her brother's body. When I got to the jail, I didn't really have much hope that this would work 
it was my last shot. I went in and they listened. They did not cut me off. They didn't dis dismiss me. And that's when she met Deputy John Franklin, who started giving her directions. He said, better yet, I'm going with you. I said, hey, listen, you know, I know what you're going through personally because two months ago, I just lost my brother. Deputy Franklin's baby brother, Ryan, was also murdered. And in that moment when Erin shared with you what happened to her, what did that feel like sharing that space at that time? It, it took me back. It took me, it took me there. So I knew exactly how she felt. It's, it's very painful. Um, I would have never imagined in a million years that I would have lost my younger brother. There's some times where I just think about, um, you know, my brother and just calling him. Erin needed her brother's wife to sign the paperwork, so Deputy Franklin stayed with her while another deputy went to get the signature. Erin says Franklin stayed with her until the papers were signed. Once it was signed, they sent it back to me, gave me their condolences. He even, you know, gave me a little bit of counseling and said, you know, this will pass and you will get through this. They went above and beyond their job today because that's definitely not their job. Like many of our deputies, she's just a very caring, empathetic person who really genuinely wants to serve others. And that service comes in many different forms sometimes. Shannon Volkadoff says Deputy Franklin was also part of a team of deputies who saved a man who tried to jump off their second floor building after an unfavorable court hearing just a few weeks ago. I can't even explain to you what it meant, how much compassion they showed me and how, you know, helpful they were. All right, weather time. Our chief meteorologist, Chris Holcomb, is here. And the weekend looks like it is going to be busy as far as precipitation, right? You know, it's going to be the scattered variety. I think we'll have fewer showers on Saturday and Sunday than what we've been dealing with over the past few days. So not a washout. It'll be looking a little bit better for the weekend. We had some of those showers and storms that you know, may move through our area earlier today. And the main threat with these is they had a lot of rain with them. Yeah, we did have some winds up to 40 miles an hour. They were never really classified as severe. We had a lot of lightning with them, but those have moved off to the east now and we're finally drying out after that heavy rain that came through here a little bit earlier. Now what's left of this is already to the east of Athens. It's moving through uh, areas of Madison and Oglethorpe County, pushing into Elbert County and not too far off. There's Lake Hartwell right there. Just a few showers there, but that's all about to move over into uh, South Carolina and we'll finally start to have a quiet night out there for the rest of the nighttime hours. We've been watching these showers around uh, Birmingham and south and east of Birmingham, and I was telling you that I would think that they would weaken and they're doing that right now. A couple of showers could still make it into Cleburne and Randolph County, but I think those will still fall apart before they move into West Georgia. Let me show you what's happening out there right now. This is a live look up in Rome where things have been drying out for a good bit today. They didn't have a lot of rain in Rome earlier today, so a nice night there up in Northwest Georgia. Take a look at some of these pictures after the rain moved on over uh, to the east. We saw a few rainbows out there. I got a lot of pictures from our storm trackers tonight. This one from Travis Acona and Tucker, where you can see a nice full rainbow right there, even a double one. And then here's another picture. This is from storm tracker Lauren Williams, and uh, she was in the Lawrenceville area tonight and got this vivid rainbow here and then also part of a double one right there as well. So a lot of rainbows out there uh, tonight in those areas that got some rain and then the sun came down from the west and kind of went through those uh, moisture particles still in, the, still in the air and caused those rainbows. Right now we're 71. The rain really helped to cool things off. It's 69 in Marietta right now, lower 70s in Carrollton, Canton, Athens. You're also at 70 degrees, so a comfortable night, even though it's still kind of damp out there from the rain that came through earlier. Tomorrow, fewer showers, a 40% chance to rain, and it's more of the afternoon variety. We'll see high temperatures near 87, so we'll give that a six on the wasometer. There's that last bit of the rain continuing to move out tonight, overnight mainly dry. In the morning, a dry start. Like this morning, you know, we had a few showers around, but I think we're going back to that pattern of the afternoon and evening variety of showers. Still dry at noontime, but then after lunch, not a widespread coverage of rain. We're just talking about scattered showers that'll be moving through our area into the evening, kind of scattered too. And then on Sunday, the same story with a mixture of sunshine and clouds, and then those scattered showers that'll develop in the afternoon. Those rain chances there are also going to be at about 40%. Here's the latest on Tropical Storm Bora. This is around the Leeward Islands right now. It's going to move through Puerto Rico, we think, uh, over the 
the weekend, also impacting the U.S. and British Virgin Islands. That's where they have tropical storm warnings in effect. Also, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, the storm will continue moving near Cuba and then going between Cuba and South Florida uh, once we get into Monday. And then as it moves into the Gulf, that's when we think it'll become a hurricane. And this system will shift a little bit more to the west, we think, instead of the Florida Panhandle. It's kind of moving more toward uh, Louisiana. And of course, there's another tropical depression out there as well that could become a hurricane in the Gulf too. Yeah, two hurricanes possible in the Gulf next week. We'll just have to wait and see. We really think that these systems may be um, shifting a little bit based on those scattered or based on how close they are to each other and we'll see those storms kind of falling apart or kind of one of them may weaken and the other one may hold together a little bit more but we'll, we'll keep you posted on that into next week here is your crazy weather wow moment this was taken yesterday off the coast of louisiana and mississippi multiple water spouts in the gulf of mexico this has nothing to do with the tropical systems it's too far away for that just a amazing look at uh, at one point we counted like eight or nine water spouts all lined up there so thank you for this uh, amazing uh, weather wow moment we also get local weather wow moments from you guys on our 11 alive community storm trackers page on facebook just search 11 alive storm trackers ask to become a member of that group we'll let you in you can also share your information and see other people's weather information there too georgia's film industry is getting back to work during the pandemic up next the shows and movies too soon filmed right here in the peach state and Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear, on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd Georgia's film industry is coming back to life. The state film office and the studio chief say pre-production on films and TV shows are reviving an industry that all but died with the start of the pandemic. 11 Alive's Doug Richards takes a look at what's going on. At Southeast Atlanta's Black Hall studio, production workers quietly started returning to work about three weeks ago to begin the prep work for movies made by Marvel and Fox and a TV series on Netflix, titles all undisclosed. Right now, our on the ground is uh, producers, uh, their accounting teams, uh, there's some set builders, 
Um, but it's all the pre-production or the pre-principal photography guys that are on the ground getting started. Brian Millsap, Black Hall's chairman and CEO, says he expects on-set and on-scene shoots to start in earnest again in Georgia about a month from now. The state film office lists 29 titles now in production or pre-production in Georgia. One third of them feature films. I was trying to protect our family. Ozark, a Netflix show set in Missouri but shot in North Georgia, will reportedly start shooting again in November. Millsap says the state's cavernous studios and abundant outdoor space are ideal for social distancing and that new pandemic protocols are in use in the film industry. I think we've learned enough about this virus to know how to fight it and not have to just stay home and quarantine. Seems like your greatest fear is that some A-list star would get COVID in Georgia and those headlines would spread around the world. I think they're taking, you know, uh, very strong precautions with all of the actors and, and working to keep them as isolated as possible and keep as few people on set as possible when we're filming. Millsap says Black Hall has installed a new air handling system similar to those used in hospitals. In a statement, Lee Thomas of the State Film Production Office says studios seem to be filling up quickly and are really going above and beyond to keep their production safe, bringing a glimmer of light to a Georgia economy racked with grim news over the last 23 weeks. Looking forward to people getting back to work and some new content filmed here in Georgia. Yeah. All right, Jeff, well, good to see you on this Friday night. It's time for me to head out to get ready for Up Late coming up in about 35 minutes on 11 Alive. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. We will see you next uh, week. See you on Monday. Here's what's coming up on the Big 36 where news is king. Colleges across the country trying to go on with in-person learning and to keep COVID-19 transmission down. We're getting a look at some of the contact tracing technology that will hopefully keep students on campus. Uncertainty. Some things become more clear. The things we take for granted. The people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you. We hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people, or are you doing this to make money, or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help. Now let's turn a top police officer out of a job. Johns Creek's former police chief at the center of a confidential settlement. He got a payout after accusations of sexual harassment. The Reveal investigative team fought for 10 days to force the city to release the confidential agreement. Ron Jones has that story. A shocking revelation from the Johns Creek Police Department. These documents reveal sexual harassment allegations from a female police department employee against former police chief Christopher Byers. The internal investigation says Byers told the female employee this blank, referring to his own genitalia, is not going to suck itself. And the document says there were multiple witnesses at the time. After she complained, the document says during an investigation, Byers later admitted that he did indeed made the comment but said it differently. Byers had been with the department since March 2008, promoted to captain, then major. Byers was then promoted to chief this year after the woman made the allegation. Initially, the department determined no policies were violated because, quote, the conduct was not unwanted, though the female employee said she was flabbergasted and embarrassed and humiliated. Byers was then suspended in June, not for the sexual harassment allegations, but for controversial comments he made about the Black Lives Matter movement on social media. But during that suspension, he strikes a secret deal with city officials. The council met in executive session and agreed to a confidential agreement with Chief Byers to pay him $325,000 if he agrees to resign and not sue the city. This, as city officials recently levied a 13% tax increase on residents, citing loss of revenue from the pandemic. We don't know yet about the female employee. Her name is redacted, and we have to do more records requests. This is what the first day of fall semester looks like at the University of Georgia. Spaced out desks, masks on, and ready to learn. The UGA community members are encouraged to log uh, any symptoms of COVID-19 each day before coming to campus using an app. Students are also required to log on to any positive COVID-19 tests. Universities all across the country are trying to figure out how to continue with classes safely. We have some pitfalls that we've already seen at Oklahoma State University, a sorority house under quarantine after exposure week one. But the administration stepping up its efforts to wipe out the virus, including advanced contact tracing. NBC's Morgan Chesky got an exclusive look at the technology in action. Colleges and universities changing course nationwide, halting in-person classes after COVID outbreaks and scenes of packed parties like this at Villanova, University of North Georgia, and this scene near Oklahoma State University just before school started. Over the weekend, an off-campus sorority house quarantined with 23 members testing positive. The school is hoping to keep more than 23,000 students safe with a high-tech solution to contact tracing, something that uses everything from course attendance to card swaps to campus purchases to, most importantly, Wi-Fi on the students' phones when they set foot on campus. To see how this technology works, we followed Jared Moore for a day in the life of a college freshman. Leaving his fraternity house, Jared heads towards campus. First stop, the student union to buy a snack. Better way to start the day. Thank you. Then it's off to class. Just starting class. Yeah, I finally made it. All social distancing. Um, okay. Maybe as far as it goes. Afterwards, a quick stop at the library. A short break at a pet therapy event. Otis, shake. Hey, boy. boy. Finally, lunchtime, where Jared goes off campus. Then an afternoon gym sesh before heading back to his fraternity house. Got some guys hanging out in here. Oh, what's up, Jerry? The next day, a look behind a high-tech curtain. 
he had class in that building. You can see student union. There was a food purchase, so that's a card swipe. Dr. Christy Hawkins oversees the contact tracing technology. What we can see, of course, is the buildings that he was in. Those are the ones that are highlighted in orange. But you can also see the possible contact locations. With more than 5,000 Wi-Fi hotspots around campus, Hawkins says they can know exactly where a sick student may have been. What this basically tells us is the buildings he was in for at least 15 minutes throughout the day. And specifically where in those buildings and he was. And where in those buildings. So if I go into the library, you're not only going to be able to say, uh, I was on the first floor, but I was on this side of the building in the first floor. Here's who I could have come into contact with. Yes. But when it comes to off campus, we would not be able to track that. So this is limited to on-campus activity. As for having their activity tracked, students have mixed feelings. It feels like, you know, we're kind of like being spied on, but not really. If it helps us with COVID and keeps everybody safe from the harmful effects of it, then I'm all for it. The university's president stressing the information gathered is private. I mean, we've got lots of information on everybody on our campus, but we don't distribute it. We don't share it with anybody. To already have more than 20 members of an OSU sorority testing positive, a house under quarantine, do you feel prepared? It worked the way it was supposed to work. Everybody that was involved in recruitment was tested and they were negative, but somebody came in that was positive. For students, educators, and university leaders, navigating this pandemic might just be the toughest class yet. American teachers have been officially declared critical infrastructure workers. According to the White House, under the designation, teachers are subject to the same kinds of safety guidelines as other essential workers, like doctors and law enforcement officers. So that means that teachers can continue to work even after exposure to a confirmed case of COVID-19, provided they remain asymptomatic. Now, the move is just the latest in the administration's aggressive campaign to bring students back to in-person learning this fall. Tonight, 11 Alive wants to shine a spotlight on race in America and the words that we use when protesters take the streets demanding police reform. Some pivot the conversation to black on black crime. But does that phrase unfairly perpetuate racism? Here's Reveal investigator Andy Parati. When a black man dies at the hands of law enforcement, outrage on the street often follows. But so does another narrative. 93% of blacks in America are killed by other blacks. Why is there not the outrage when there's black on black violence? Black on black crime, a catchphrase some believe conservatives use to distract from police brutality. And it makes it so bad, it's black on black crime. A phrase also recently used by Doherty County Coroner Michael Fowler after a rise in homicides near Albany this past May. Nobody's saying anything. Like it's just something they're pushing up under the rug. Not so, says Clifton Crowley. He says black communities are talking about it. The media just isn't paying attention. Crowley is the community chair for the Atlanta NAACP. There's always been a deep level of concern for violence and, and poverty and crime within our community. The licensed social worker points to a long list of local and national organizations focused on reducing violence in black communities, including street groomers, 100 black men of Atlanta, and former President Barack Obama's My Brother's Keepers initiative. You have to look beyond the race. Rodney Bryant is Atlanta's interim police chief. He doesn't dispute violence in black communities is a problem. In Atlanta, 81% of victims to violent crimes were black in 2018. Nearly 90% of people arrested for those crimes were black too. But Bryant argues violence is often a side effect of generational racism, which has created a health, wealth, and education gap. I think it does do a, the black community a, a disservice when you say it's a black on black crime because now you're saying it's just a black problem. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the majority of violent crime happens within the same race. A 2018 national survey found offenders were within the same race as the victim 70% of the time for blacks, 62% for whites. Here again is the Doherty County Coroner speaking with 11 Alive's Faith Abube. Have you ever used the term white on white crime or Hispanic on Hispanic crime? No, if I see it, I'll say it. I just call a spade a spade a problem. For 
black people who use that term. I want you to think about the systematic racism that has occurred in this country and the effects of taking out three million black faces, incarcerating them, and releasing them back into the community. But while I'll be a Democratic candidate, I will be an American president. Joe Biden accepting the Democratic Party nomination for president, getting high marks for his virtual speech last night. Joining me now is Chuck Todd, the moderator of Meet the Press. Chuck, uh, good reviews for Joe Biden last night. I am reading Peggy Noonan in the Wall Street Journal today where she says the Democrats missed the meaning that they clearly are offering much, but they're not offering any plans about how they're going to do their so-called much. Well, I think there's no doubt in my mind, Jeff, that was intentional. You know, I think that what Joe Biden is trying to be is all things to a coalition that includes AOC and John Kasich, right? And, and he's in some ways making the case that, hey, I'm me. I know how I will, I'm not going to get pushed around, but I, I'm also an open mind and I listen and I will, I will take, I will take it, I will take advice from everybody. And he's making a bet that that's what the country wants. Um, I do think this is a, this is a, it, I think they're right. My gut is they're right that this is not going to be a policy election, that this is a, this is a Trump character election. But Hillary Clinton made the same bet four years ago. Now, the difference is what? Hillary Clinton has, didn't have a united Democratic Party around her the way I think Joe Biden does around him. Um, uh, her attacks on Trump's character were theoretical. Now you have four years to use examples of to make the same case. Look, if they started talking about specific policy proposals, what happens to your, those moderate Republicans that seem to want to gravitate towards Joe Biden? So look, the, they, can, they can throw a wide tent if they're united on one issue, which is ousting Donald Trump. The minute you start talking about other stuff, that's when that tent starts to get holes in it. So the Republicans get their shot next week. What about lessons in this? What is their approach likely to be? Is it, is it a lot of patriotism? Is it a lot of, you know, somewhat what Nixon did in 68 when there was a lot going on in the streets where you're talking about law and order? Is that what we're going to see a lot of? You know, Jeff, it looks to me as if there's a bit of a, they're having a bit of a, a debate about that because I've noticed message whiplash out of the president. You know, if you think about it, the, the Democrats painted a pretty dark picture of things. Uh, and an even darker one of what they think life would be like in a second term. Donald Trump likes to paint a very dark picture of what he thinks <laughs> a life would be like if Joe Biden uh, uh, wins. Um, but when you have a country where 70% of the country thinks we're headed in the wrong direction, 60 plus percent think we we don't have a good plan to deal with the virus, that's not a, a, co a country that's in a good mood. And so you have a president who wants on the virus to project optimism, to project that, hey, he's we're turning the corner because he wants his response to be viewed as a good job. Um, but if, the, if, if their tone and tenor doesn't sort of meet the atmosphere of where these swing voters are, then they could look tone deaf here. And, and that's the question I have. Is it, is it a convention that's designed to please just the base? Or are they gonna attempt to talk to this middle that is exhausted? Chuck Todd, thank you. Meet the press air is Sunday at 10 a.m. on 11 Alive. We appreciate it. Have a good weekend. This is Tropical Storm Mora moving in right now over the northern Leeward Islands. And then we also have Tropical Depression 14 right here that's going to be moving into the Gulf of Mexico soon. We're waiting for the 11 p.m. advisory to know whether or not that Tropical Depression is now going to be Tropical Storm Marco. We'll have updates for you coming up. Up next in sports, the rain cleared in time for the Braves to take on the Phillies. We'll see how the Braves' top prospect fared in his debut make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. 
We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit C. In the midst of a pandemic, financial struggles are forcing two rural hospitals to close their doors. This in a part of the state where the number of ICU beds available to treat patients already are in the single digits, and community leaders fear it could just be the beginning. Here's 11 Alive's Brittany Klein Peter with the story. There are at least a dozen hospitals in rural Georgia that are going to close. This week, Northridge Medical Center announced it will be closing its doors. Three weeks ago, Southwest Georgia Regional Medical Center came to the same conclusion. Both hospitals will be closing in October, laying off over 100 employees, leaving the communities they serve in a difficult spot. Staff at Southwest Georgia Regional say that it has become increasingly difficult for small critical access hospitals to survive in rural areas, and that, quote, COVID-19 pushed the Cuthbert Hospital past the point of no return. The new Georgia project is a statewide initiative to help increase access to services for communities of color. The president of the organization warns these closures will take a toll on Georgia's poorest families. One of us is unprotected. If one of us doesn't have access to health care, then none of us are safe and none of us actually have access to health care. Health care lobbyist Monty Vizi cautions that rural hospitals are major economic engines for the communities and have experienced devastating losses due to COVID-19. Regardless of its size, is the economic engine in the community. Then when you that hospital closes, we've seen other business that have Earlier this week, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services announced that the agency would give more than $35 million to states to support rural hospitals. But the worry is it's merely a Band-Aid. In a state where over 100 people are dying every day, uh, highlights and puts a fine point on the need for universal access to quality health care. 
According to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, a large number of uninsured and poor Georgians live in Randolph County, which is where Southwest Georgia Regional is located. It's also the same county that had the highest rate of infection in April of this year. We are watching the heavy rain that came through Atlanta earlier move well off to the east. It's now even east of Athens and it's moving over uh, toward the uh, Elberton area and also toward the South Carolina line. It was heavy over Atlanta where we had uh, a lot of thunder and lightning, 40 mile an hour winds with it. And then it gradually started weakening a little bit, still brought that heavy rain through Gwinnett, also into areas of Oconee County, Barrow County, Clark County, and now even still a little bit of thunder and lightning as it's near Elberton and it's about to cross over the line into South Carolina. Also a few showers up here uh, near Hartwell. That's about to cross over the lake and that's going to be diminishing as it moves up into South Carolina too. And then for the rest of the nighttime hours, we're going to be dry. We've been watching these showers that were over near Birmingham with thunder and lightning. We were telling you that those would be weakening. And that's what the, what's happening with them now. Maybe just a couple of showers coming into Cleveland and Randolph, but I really don't expect much for you in West Georgia tonight. Speaking of West Georgia, look at Carrollton. You're 69 degrees right now. Marietta, also 69 degrees, comfortable. Uh, 71 though in Atlanta, lower 70s elsewhere. And that's thanks to that rain that came through a little bit earlier that cooled things off. We only got up to 81 for a high today. And tomorrow we're going to get up to 87. That's going to be a lot warmer. And the rain chances tomorrow will be lower. They don't go away, but they do come down a little bit. We'll have about a 40% chance for showers. We'll give that a six on the wisometer. Here's the forecast track. Those showers moving out and then tomorrow morning we start off dry. Even some sunshine and clouds mixing together at lunchtime. A mix of sun and clouds and then in the afternoon, you know, this isn't showing a lot of widespread rain. We're only going to have just a few hit and miss showers in the afternoon. So really the weekend pretty good. Not as many showers tomorrow as we've been seeing the past few days and then on Sunday it's pretty much the same pattern. A dry morning lunchtime still dry. Maybe a few more clouds and then Scattered showers will be developing once we head into the afternoon hours there as well. And then we go down a little bit more to those rain chances uh, that will be lower on Monday. Here's a look. We're still waiting for the 11 p.m. advisory to come in on Tropical Storm Laura and our Tropical Depression that's in the Caribbean that could be upgraded to Tropical Storm Marco. We hope to have that information for you tonight at 11 on up late. But here's the latest track we have on Laura becoming a hurricane moving into the Gulf. We think by late Monday, Tuesday and then Wednesday possible landfall over toward Louisiana. This track is actually shifting a little bit more to the west compared to what we were thinking yesterday when it could go into the Gulf. And of course, we're watching this, our tropical depression uh, that also could become a hurricane and then make landfall as a tropical storm in Texas, we think on Tuesday. And yeah, you're right. We could have two tropical systems, maybe even two hurricanes at the same time in the Gulf of Mexico next week. 40% chance for showers for your Saturday and Sunday, 30% chance Monday, then a 40% chance Tuesday and Wednesday. And I want to tell you Thursday and Friday, those rain chances are really going to be highly dependent on what happens with those tropical systems and whether or not it'll spread any tropical moisture or tropical remnants our way. It has been two long days since the Braves' top prospect, Christian Poche, heard that he was getting called up for his big league debut. And finally, it was able to happen after the rain cleared. He would take on the Phillies ace, Aaron Nola. Nola got the better of Poche for the first time, a strikeout. Poche one for four so far tonight. From there, things went south for the Phillies ace. He unraveled in the third, back-to-back -back home runs for the Braves and an RBI double for Camargo. Nola pulled after three, the shortest outing of his career. Braves lead 11-1. They are in the seventh inning. Late Thursday night on the West Coast, an ex-Buford High School star and Georgia Tech star made his Major League Baseball debut. Joey Bart caught for the Giants against the Angels, and he also got his first big league hit. Bart said the support back home has been overwhelming. I have a lot of support um, from back home, and, you know, that, that means a lot to me. So uh, I'm trying to get back to them, <laughs> and uh, I've crushed a bunch of it, but I still got some more, and I just want to get back to everyone and, you know, thank them for supporting me and, and you know, watching me as, as late as it is back home. Scotty Scheffler is a rookie, had a great PGA Championship Friday, kept it going, a 59 at TPC Boston. The second time he has done it this year, his first coming in a round of golf during quarantine. He is the second youngest on tour to ever do it, just 24. Justin Thomas broke 60 
when he was 23. Georgia defensive coordinator Dan Lenning preparing for the fast approaching football season like everybody else. His defense was top five in every statistical category last year and he returns plenty of players. He said it's the quick turnaround that is the challenge for his unit. I think the one key is we all know is we're going to have to be ready quick, right? We got to get ready to go play this first game. Um, and it starts, like I said, at the very beginning today uh, with that focus. But yeah, we have a, a lot of adjustments we've made, um, you know, throughout the program this year, just because of the uniqueness of, uh, you know, the pandemic and everything that takes place with that. Atlanta United back on the pitch on Saturday. They will be home at the Benz playing Nashville SC. They have an interim head coach in Stephen Glass and now Joseph Martinez for the remainder of the year. So we will see what happens. This we know. We'll take a break. We'll close it up right after this. Great diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. We're going to see the rain chances coming down a little bit tomorrow with a 40% chance for showers. High temperatures up to 87 Saturday, 86 on Sunday. And then um, rain chances a little lower Monday at 30%, back up to 40% on Tuesday and Wednesday. And by Thursday and Friday, those rain chances a little bit higher, but that all depends on what is going to be happening with those tropical systems as they move inland. I just got the 11 p.m. advisory in and Tropical Depression 14 is now a tropical storm. Tropical Storm Marco has developed. We'll have more on that forecast track for you coming up tonight at 11 on Up Late. All right, Chris, thank you and thank you for watching. We appreciate it. The weekend is upon us. Enjoy it. 11alive.com is your place for all the information. We will see you on Monday. 
juice cast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, 